Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This new podcast has been downloaded more than 1.5 million times over the last five months, thanks to listeners like you. Next week, we'll be launching season two of the podcast, bringing you more evidence and experience about a broader range of topics, including but not limited to COVID-19. This week, we're checking in with people we interviewed in some of our most powerful episodes from season one. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks again to Dr. Chris Byrer, a Johns Hopkins epidemiologist who we heard from in April. She gets an update on the state of COVID-19 in jails, prisons, and detention centers. The numbers are not encouraging. Let's listen. Chris Byer, thank you so much for joining me. Delighted to be here. So we spoke several months ago now about the issue of COVID in jails and prisons and detention centers. So I'd like to start with a little update, sort of. I know we were very worried uh, at the time that this would become a real problem in these institutions. And I think what you're about to tell me is you were right. You know, you never want to be proven right by human suffering. (laughs) However, that is really what we're seeing. And we had, you know, I, I, as an epidemiologist who's done some work on infectious diseases in prisons, I knew right away that this was going to be a real problem. And, And as we talked about some months ago, it was among the first big outbreaks in Wuhan, where the this virus first broke out into pandemic form, uh, were prisons and jails there, a substantial proportion of the cases. So we knew that was an issue. And of course, it's always this problem of indoor facilities, crowded density, population density, uh, all of those things, uh, and the hygiene issues, um, make prisons, jails, and detention centers particularly vulnerable to respiratory viruses and certainly specifically to this virus. So uh, we were ringing the alarm bells. We were trying to uh, encourage decarceration, uh, to reduce overcrowding, to get people out of jails, for example, who had only fees or fines or other forms of administrative detention. Um, And largely, the response was too slow, too little, too few releases. Uh, And now we find ourselves, uh, uh, of course, the, the pandemic is going badly all over the world, uh, but the United States remains the most affected country. And we have uh, an enormous number of outbreaks in prisons, state and federal prisons and jails. We have close to 50,000 people now in federal and state prisons who have tested positive. We've had you know, a large number of deaths. We have more than 10,000 staff of federal and state prisons who've acquired COVID, some of them in the community, but of course, many of them also uh, through their work in, in prisons and jails. So it has, um, it's been extremely frustrating, but we have had some victories too. Tell me about the victories. Well, one very important case, uh, of course, the, there's a relatively small number of people compared to prisoners uh, and detainees in jails who are in immigration detention. So, uh, you know, roughly there are 2.3 million people in prison and jails in the United States. It's, of course, an enormous population. There are only, in general, about 35 to 40,000 people in immigration detention. This is detention uh, under the uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, as they are known. Um, And in the past, the great majority of these people would never have been detained. It's only in this administration that we have made a policy of detaining people while they are awaiting their, for example, hearings on asylum. Uh, And of course, everybody in the country is very aware that one of the things that has been happening with this administration was separating children from their parents who were in these detention facilities, which was terrible policy and decried and and which number of court cases stopped the administration from doing that. 
We were reached out to by a group of, of lawyers working with clients who were in the immigration detention center, so an ICE facility in El Paso, Texas. And these were, uh, the petitioners were five older women, all Latina uh, women, who had, in addition to their age, at least one, if not more, pre-existing conditions like diabetes, hypertension, that would have predisposed them to do badly if they did get COVID. And they were in a very crowded detention facility. These facilities were never prepared to handle a pandemic. There are shared bathrooms, there are shared sinks, there are shared toilets, there are shared eating areas. It's typically up to about 80 people segregated by gender, in this case about 80 women in one of these holding areas, uh, sharing crowded common space, uh, limitations on soap and hand washing and on, on the ability to do the required social distancing. So what we were asked was to say, is it possible that th these women can be protected from COVID-19 if there is a transmission in this facility? And if not, would they be likely to have a more serious complication or even death? And so we reviewed all that evidence and we worked with the lawyers and they sent us detailed plans of the facility and housing arrangements and bathroom arrangements. And we determined uh, that absolutely not. ICE could not protect these women and that they would be at high risk if they got exposed. Uh, and then that case went to a federal judge because ICE is, of course, a part of the federal government. So a federal judge had to adjudicate. He agreed. He ordered all five women released. They all had family in the United States. So they all got to go home. But more importantly, in his ruling, he cited our scientific evidence and said that ICE had failed uh, to prove that they could protect these women from exposure. Mm -hmm. So that's a very important federal precedent because yes. that applies, of course, uh, to multiple facilities. Mm -hmm. And of course, those in detention centers are not criminals. And frankly, many of the people in jails are not. They're awaiting a trial. Talk to me about the ongoing threat in jails, which seems to have been made worse by um, these protests we're seeing where people are getting arrested. That's right. That's right. Well, there's been a, it's really been very striking. There was one important study uh, out of Cook County in Chicago where there was a very serious outbreak in prisons and jails. And that showed a suggestion that, that a significant, up to about 25% of the cases in the surrounding community were attributable to transmission from the jail and from people cycling through the jail. So the big difference for those who don't know that much about this is that um, prison, federal and state penitentiaries are where people generally are housed after they have a felony conviction. Jails, which are run by counties and cities and are typically are people awaiting sentencing or awaiting a trial or who have are being detained for a short period of time, and there's a great deal more cycling through, people coming in and out. That, of course, is a risk for COVID, because you have people coming out of the community and then going back. Now, of course, there have been a, a large number of protests against police brutality and racial inequality, structural racism in every state in this country, and some have been met with restraint, and some have been met, as we know, with large numbers of arrests and detentions. There was a situation in New York in June where it appeared that many hundreds of demonstrators were being held up to 24 hours or longer in crowded detention cells. And all they were waiting for is to get a ticket and to get their court date for when they're supposed to have a hearing. So those people should, if they should be arrested at all, should be there for an hour. And that would, of course, dramatically reduce COVID exposure. And it's not just in the jail itself. It's also that people are being loaded onto crowded buses from protests. Uh, they are, have to go through processing when they get there. All of that has to be done, if it's done at all, with appropriate social distancing, with hygiene. And we, we don't think that that's really being done. Uh, you, can, you can see the images uh, of the protesters. And of course, it's very hard to stay six feet away from people when you are being arrested and handcuffed and forced into a bus. 
so that is a that is a real concern. It's also a concern, of course, that um, police and, and the National Guard and others have been using tear gas and other irritants uh, on people, which forces them to cough, and of course, typically also to take their masks off. So, so we're you know concerned for a number of reasons, but. Really, the, the idea of detaining people and putting them in, in a crowded jail cell while awaiting what are essentially just administrative procedures is totally unacceptable from a public health perspective in the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. Now, some I have seen, you know, we've seen high profile names in the news. Some have been allowed to go home early because of COVID. Others are still being sent to prison. Should we be keeping the nonviolent folks home for now? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think I think the uh, you know the, the the really tragic news here is that in these crowded facilities where there has been comprehensive testing, and we're still not doing anywhere near enough testing to keep people safe in these facilities. And by the way, when I say people, we're we're concerned about all the people. We're concerned about the guards, the staff. Actually, a very significant proportion of the people who work in prisons are contract hires, low-income workers who are also being exposed. And then, of course, you know, are very concerned as we all are about their families and other people that they live with. So, so this is you know, this affects a much wider group of people than just those who are detained. But what we're very concerned about is that where there has been comprehensive testing, the numbers have just been extraordinarily high. So the very first prison to do this was in Marion, Ohio, uh, and they decided because of the outbreak that was going on there, they wanted to screen everybody and more than 70% of the detainees and staff were already uh, COVID positive. Wow, that's a huge number. Huge number. So right now, uh, you know, at the beginning, many will remember that early on, we were so worried about nursing homes and long-term care facilities, which are also closed, crowded places, uh, but with a very vulnerable group of patients, obviously. But uh, now, more than five of the 10 biggest clusters of COVID cases in the United States are in prisons and jails. This is now where the epidemic is going to go and where many of us are worried it's likely to linger because the conditions in these facilities have not changed. So we are still calling on public health grounds for decarceration, for reducing the number of people detained. And I must say there also have been some important wins there. So, for example, in Baltimore, in our local community, uh, the state's attorney for Baltimore, Marilyn Mosby, uh, early on uh, made the announcement that Baltimore would not be jailing people for administrative fees and fines and other kinds of things in an effort to avoid the overcrowding uh, in the jails and facilities. Um, that has happened in a number of municipalities, and it's, it's really very encouraging. But uh, it's been a much harder situation for people who are already inside Typically, you know, even when, for example, Governor Hogan ordered the release of 800 prisoners, it's not entirely clear how many of them were released. But eventually that all goes to parole boards. The parole boards are not meeting. The courts are not open in many municipalities. And, uh, and so it is very frustratingly slow. Uh, and of course, COVID-19 has shown us it's anything but slow. Right. And we don't have much time left, but I do want to talk to you quickly about a case in New York that uh, involving a death row inmate. Yeah, yeah. So this, this is an extraordinary situation. So the, the administration has just restarted after almost two decades uh, pursuing uh, executions. And you probably just saw there was a Supreme Court decision that uh, will also allow this with uh, lethal injection with just one agent. Um, so there are, of course, a number of people on death row. This particular case, the, the incarcerated person is actually in a federal prison in Indiana, but his lawyer is a New Yorker, uh, and she is an older person who also has underlying health conditions. So she reached out to us to say, could we weigh in on the safety and the provisions for herself, her legal team for this man, and for his family to come to this facility and see him. Uh, the government set his uh, 
date of execution for mid-July. And it turns out that there is COVID in the prison. There's COVID in the community around this prison. There, uh, it's a state with rising rates of infection. So not only do people have to get in and out of the prison to see him, but they also have to get in and out of the state. And in the case of the lawyer, they have to fly. Uh, so they're in and out of airports. And, and so this immediately raises the question, is it safe? Uh, and our determination was no, it is not, and uh, that the execution should be stayed uh, until it's safe for this man to say goodbye to his family and to see his lawyers and representatives, and you know that that shouldn't happen before uh, there is control achieved. And and what the lawyers asked for was uh, basically the middle of next year, so 2021. We'll see how that goes. Um, I think, you know, the, the whole idea of the government deciding to ramp up executions in the time of a pandemic is, seems extraordinarily, uh, you know, an extraordinary waste of human energy and talent. I mean, you know, we, we have an epidemic to fight. That's, <laughs> that's what we all ought to be concentrating on, particularly the Justice Department, because, you know, these are uh, people under their uh, administrative control. I do want to say one other thing that, that I think has been a, a really an important outcome of all of this uh, work, and that is that the school helped connect me with two uh, doctoral students and also a medical student who are interested in, in working on these issues and who are interested in incarceration and health. Uh, and they have been working closely with me on all of this work. Uh, we got a small amount of money from a foundation. I have matched that with my uh, Tutu uh, endowment. I'm the Desmond Tutu professor. Uh, and so we have a modest endowment there. And uh, so they have turned into a full-time <laughs> machine of data collection and declaration writing. And because they've been working at this for many months for free and doing such a fantastic job, um, I've been able to hire them uh, for the summer, which is a wonderful thing, but we've also uh, made them all uh, Desmond Tutu scholars. Uh, so they are uh, three extraordinary young people. And uh, if you go to our website, you'll see their names and bios. And, and uh, it's really, for me, just been so encouraging that there are talented young people who care about what is after all, the most marginalized population, the least among us, the people whose liberty we've taken away. Chris Byer, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.